Hello my friends and welcome to the Heroes of Might and Magic 3 Creatures tier list revisited. About a year ago I did a video where I put every creature from the game into a single tier list as you can see playing out in fast forward here behind me. Now there's a link in the description below if you want to check out that video to uh, get the background on things but if you've already seen that or you don't care and you just want to enjoy the show stick around and we'll get started. And so this is the list as it currently stands. Over the course of the year or so since it's been up on YouTube, uh, I've had amazing feedback from the community. Lots and lots of comments and debates raging uh, in the comments section about my choices. Some controversial ones that uh, a lot of people really strongly disagree with. Some that people generally do uh, agree with as well. And that's been fantastic and that was my mission sort of all along. One thing though that really came up that I'd probably underappreciated is the sheer degree to which Horn of the Abyss has kind of taken over the interest uh, of most of the community and I'd also underappreciated how fantastic it is as a community mod the attention to detail not just to the game and the gameplay itself but to all of the wonderful flavor graphics music uh, almost everything uh, that the developers of Horn of the Abyss have put into that modification so I thought it would be fun to come back to the list and add in the creatures from the new town types that are added in Horn of the Abyss, that's the Cove and the Factory, which just dropped a couple of months ago. Now, in addition, Horn of the Abyss also changes the balance of the creatures in the existing game. There are some creatures on this list, in particular, say, the Phoenixes, the Magogs, that um, really get a serious uh, edit, shall we say, in the Horn of the Abyss balance changes. So we've got a few movements we need to make on this list as well, and that'll sort of be the second phase of the video. And then uh, to round things out, I'd like to address uh, some of the most heated debates in the comments section. There are a few things I think you guys have convinced me of, um, perhaps uh, a couple of creatures I was a bit too harsh on. There are some mistakes I just made where I, in the first video I just forgot the build order of certain things and the cost in particular of a couple of creatures that uh, I want to amend as well at the end. Um, so stick around and we'll get through all of that. But for now, let's get cracking. We've got the cove and the factory. I think I'm actually going to start with the factory creatures. Before we get started, I'd like to just refresh everyone's memory as to how it is I'm ranking the creatures. I like to play the game on the uh, impossible difficulty, starting at zero resources and having to work and scrounge my way economically through all of the early and mid game. And as a result, what I'm looking for in a creature is something that is great value something I'm really eager to build the dwelling and start recruiting quickly and then deploying on the battlefield in favor of doing something else. So whether it's delaying my city hall or whether it's not buying the tier four creature because I'm so, so ecstatic about the tier three creature, whatever that might be, there's only so much gold and resources in the game to go around in the version I, uh, of the game I like to play. And so that's how I'm ranking the creatures. It's not about pure, pure raw damage output uh, potential or, or any of that. Um, to get to the A tier, you need to be someone I'm really, really eager to buy and to get the dwelling built quickly at the expense of doing other things across my empire. To get into the S tier, you need that. And in addition, you need some busted, broken extra angle where you just have a, you know, you, you, you deliver a, an ability or a, for the player to just leverage and um, exploit, uh, essentially, um, the, the, the game as a result. So it's quite hard to get into the A. It's very hard to get into the S. Uh, a B tier unit is someone that I'm keen to buy, happy to put money into, and I'll rely on them. Good, solid investment, happy to do that. Uh, C, again, solid, but I don't care if I don't quite get them as quickly as I possibly can. D is something I'm probably not bothering with a lot of the time, but I'll happily use them depending on the situation. And then E is something that I really don't like having to put money into. F is something that is a pet hate uh, and I just can't stand and I will almost never buy. Okay. All right. So that's the ranking order. So let's get cracking. We've got the halflings uh, up first. Okay, so I'll put each candidate here just next to my camera uh, while we're talking about them. So halflings are a whole new thing in the Horn of the Abyss. We have new artwork from the factory town for the halfling, and we're all going to have to get used to this idea that the halfling isn't what it used to be. Um, what it used to be to me was an incidental neutral creature you could pick up, be quite happy with them roaming around with your army, dealing good damage. When they inevitably die, who cares? Didn't really matter to me that much in the first place. 
quite enjoy marching them into the skeleton transformer, I uh, don't mind admitting, this kind of thing. Those days are over. Um, these guys are the base unit for the factory. And the immediate and obvious kind of temptation, I think, is to compare them to master gremlins. That we can see we scored quite highly up here. A minus for a master gremlin. Um, being at tier one, ranged damage dealer, kind of squishy. So a lot of similarities to the master gremlin. Now, in terms of damage output, they deal one to three damage instead of one to two, which is an upgrade, no doubt about it. They also have four attack instead of three attack, which is really great. You also don't need to upgrade the dwelling. Um, with masters, you have to pay a thousand gold somewhere in week one to even get them online in the first place. So already we're starting to think, well, gee, these guys should may maybe be up in the A plus region. However, the story doesn't quite end there. I have found halflings to be quite squishy and difficult to defend and to keep alive. For starters, they have a defense of two instead of a defense of three for the gremlin. And you might say, well, that's no big deal. I mean, come on. And that's, that, that, would be a, that would be a fair criticism. Where, however, when I look around at the gremlin's friends, and when I look at the halfling's friends, there's a really big difference. Master gremlins have stone gargoyles, here hidden uh, behind the wyverns, as you can see. And in the early part of the game, your stone gargoyles, you don't really mind what happens to them. You kind of, they're happy to work in defense. You're happy to trade their bodies in combat so that you don't lose master gremlins. They're a versatile unit flying around, taking care of business in the middle of the map and trying, and, and you can very much leverage and use them to keep the masters alive. By comparison, the tier two creature in the factory here, the mechanics and engineers we'll talk about now in a minute, which are both great units, but high damage dealing units that you don't really want to trade their bodies. You don't want to trade their HP to protect halflings. I, I haven't wanted to anyway, when I've been playing, I've wanted to snowball and stockpile my mechanics into a bigger stack for use later into the mid game. Now the armadillos and the iron golems are broadly comparable. The armadillos we'll talk about now in a moment are kind of comparable There's the iron golem there. He needs to be promoted by the way, um, that's D plus is, is too low for him. We'll come to that later. Um, so they're broadly comparable. The armadillo is probably a little bit better, the two hex body to, to body block the, the halflings and so on. However, when you look to the heroes as well, we've got artificers and mechanics, no, artificers and mercenaries, sorry, uh, that are leading these armies. And neither of them are particularly great at keeping the halflings alive, especially the mercenary. The mercenary increases the damage output, but it's the squishiness that's the issue for me. By comparison, Alchemists and wizards, they all have spell books, they all have 20 or 30 spell points right on day one. And they can magic arrow, they can slow, they can haste, they can mess around on the battlefield to keep these masters alive. All that means that I have found the halflings quite difficult to keep alive. They're great when you, you field them and you're up against an enemy stack of zombies or ogres or something like that, swinging their, flinging their um, uh, slingshots. Fantastic, and they deal more damage than the masters, of course. But one lucky morale flash from that stack of griffins that's flown over to the middle of the map, and you get a single hit put onto your halfling stack, and you're in a very unhappy place. So I think all of that means that I'm still going to buy them. They're still very attractive to me. I'm absolutely uh, cheesing them in the first uh, week or two. But it's likely that you'll struggle to keep the stack alive, and they might drop off in the latter part of the early game, middle of the mid game. So I think they're a priority, but they're probably in this B plus region for me. They're not really an A tier unit uh, for those reasons that I've laid out below. Um, so we'll leave them there for a moment uh, while we talk about their upgrade, the Halfling Grenadier. Okay, now here we have the Grenadier. Um, amazing artwork. He's facing the other way and he's got himself a cool top hat. These guys get upgrades to uh, damage. Essentially, they are more deadly than a basic Halfling. Um, they have 20% reduction to enemy defense, similar to the kind of behemoth ability, which is a really nice feature. If you have a good sized stack of these in the late early game, mid game, go for the upgrade. It's, it's good. It's worthwhile. They are, however, 50% more expensive per model instead of 40 gold per model, which by the way, these guys are both the same cost. These guys are 60 gold per model, and that will actually bite in and affect your economics, um, you know, in those first few weeks. How much of a massive priority are they? I think they're situational. If you've been really, really good, you've got tactics or you've got armadillo defense methodologies, you've got a big stack of guys, they're still alive. Sure, high priority upgrade. It won't always be the case though that you're in a position to do the upgrade and for it to be particularly profitable. So I think that the Grenadiers are probably in the uh, reasonable priority of the C uh, category for me. 
So mechanics and engineers, these are amazing. I mean, I absolutely love the flavor. I love the artwork of these girls. Look at this. She's got the flamethrower goggles. And then the upgraded engineer version has the welding mask uh, that she fights with as well. Now, what do we get for our money? I might start with the engineer to start with. We get damage two to five. We get movement seven. Okay. Attack seven, defense five, HP 16. Solid, solid stats for a tier two upgraded unit. Very, very solid, powerful, good unit. In addition to that, fire breathing. The flamethrower acts just like fire breath from a dragon for a tier two unit. Now that is absolutely amazing. It's so, so powerful in the right situation uh, on the battlefield to get amazing leverage out of that fire breathing. It is also possible to accidentally incinerate your own halflings, uh, and you can watch me doing that in my recent Iron Man run through uh, on uh, the Impossible Difficulty on Factory, which is available now on the channel. Um, however, if you avoid making bonehead um, decisions like, uh, like that, she's really, really powerful. I found myself uh, so far playing the factory really wanting to get up to the engineer quickly and to keep them alive. I don't want to trade their bodies, as I said before. Uh, I want to keep them alive uh, for that damage dealing uh, upside. In addition to that, if that wasn't enough, you have the repair functionality. They can repair automatons and dreadnoughts, juggernauts uh, that have been damaged, and the repair is awesome. You get tons of HP back relative to the number of engineers. It's something like a ratio of three to two. I think I worked out three engineers can uh, re uh, resurrect to uh, automatons, which is just awesome. I think that these guys are a really high priority. Um, a, I think they're an A grade unit, the engineer. Uh, I'm minded to put them sort of somewhere in this middle of the A. I don't know if they're quite as exciting and oh, I can't wait for this the way I can with some of these other units, but it's solid. She's a solid, solid creature. Somewhere up here in this high A, uh, mid A ranking for the engineer. Now the mechanic is basically an engineer that's just a bit worse in almost every way. So damage, movement, attack, uh, HP. But all of her other stats and primary things kind of remain the same. She has the fire breathing aspect and she has, not stats I shouldn't have said, but um, she has the fire breathing and she can do repair, but her repair is half as effective as the engineer's repair. Uh, th these were good, these were fine uh, in the games I've played as Factory so far, um, but again, I want to keep them alive and get them upgraded. So she's probably in that same conversation as other junior versions of powerful units, like a Green Elf. Yeah, 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 Green Elf's great, but uh, I want to upgrade it pretty quickly, um, or him. That's also the case with the mechanics, so I think the mechanics probably in this sort of region here. Okay, and so the list is getting starting to fill up, as we can see here. And we're on to armadillos and bellwether armadillos. So here we have, this is the basic version here and the bellwether version uh, to the right. These are solid, chonky units that you can get at tier three very cheaply. The dwelling is cheap and easy. You can build it immediately after, straight away actually. You don't, you don't need engineers or mechanics. You don't need that dwelling, you can skip it. In addition, they have the pen upgrade, which I've since learned the correct terminology is a horde dwelling. So in the first video, I kept talking about the accelerator building. What I mean uh, is horde dwellings, creatures like Cerberus uh, that can get extra um, you know, cages. Griffins have the same thing where you can get extra, a bo extra body count um, than you would normally get. And that tends to increase the value of creatures on this tier list because of that point about being able to create a large stack of something really powerful uh, in the um, in the time in part of the game at which that creature comes online. Now, with that said, these guys have a very specific role, uh, which is sort of hovering around or revolving around defending the halflings, defending, say, something like the gunslinger later in the game. And that is a fairly niche and specific role. The basic ones have movement four, um, and movement four is so much worse than movement five. So I don't know. I mean, they're okay. I mean, in terms of value for money, they're good. But I didn't find myself desperately wanting to buy every single one of them. I found that it was actually better to just buy some to have in your army, depending on the composition, depending on what your tactics are. Now, in terms of the Bellwether ones, you get a massive upgrade of speed from four to six, which makes a huge difference. There's a really cool feature I found as well, that when you haste an armadillo, it changes its movement animation and it rolls up in a ball and rolls across the, uh, the uh, terrain, which is really, really fun. Um, yeah, I think the Bellwether one is a bit better. It's a bit more viable as a stack. 
These guys have massive defense and really bad attack though. And so you need, if you're going to build a big stack of them and try to make use of them, you're going to want a fancy sort of move like Frenzy. There is a Frenzy hero, actually, an Artificer that specializes in Frenzy, which would turn the Armadillos from uh, very, very stonky, stodgy defensive creatures into absolute killing machines uh, for the turn that that's uh, switched on. So, yeah, a lot going on here, but in terms of appeal, oh, how many of these do I want to get and when? How quickly do I want to get it online? Eh, moderately. I think the Bellwether one is a good, solid investment. Better than average. I think the normal one is just okay-ish. Probably l languishing a little bit down. C minus, not terrible. C, C is still a good score. C is average. But um, yeah, I don't really want to be stuck with these movement four guys for very long. Bellwether ones are solid, and uh, I can see myself investing in these uh, more, uh, more, more as I play the game, uh, and I get more reps in with the factory uh, going forward. Next on the list is automatons and sentinel automatons. And the basic one here is shown on the left, the sentinel automaton upgrade on the right. What's going on with these? Well, they are uh, lifeless automatons, immune to things like morale and that kind of stuff. The basic one has movement 8 and a solid, reasonable uh, stat line of attack, damage, uh, and so on. Now, there's a feature with the, uh, particularly relevant with the basic one, where you can switch on detonation. So you can make mini stacks of these uh, with the intent of switching on detonation and having the stack die in the company of the enemy. And that causes uh, massive damage. I think it's 70 damage per uh, creature that ha is in base contact with the uh, basic automaton when it dies. I'll be honest, so far I haven't been able to leverage the detonation ability. I'm sure it is possible to do uh, completely broken things with it. Uh, and I'm hoping to um, experiment with that a little bit more in uh, the games that I'm going to play going forward. Now, when you upgrade from a basic automaton to a sentinel, you get plus one move. So you go up to nine movement. You do also get an upgrade to damage from seven damage to nine damage. It's quite a healthy damage upgrade. In addition to all that, though, the sentinel is no enemy retaliation. And we talked in the first video about, video about how important that is for my ranking of units. Units that are fast, who cannot be retaliated against, such as the ones I'm clicking up here on the left, tend to find their way very high up the list uh, because of the leverage you can get from that, the ability to swoop in, wait at the beginning of the turn, swoop in at the end of the turn, deal damage, take no retaliation, and then act early in the following turn by either attacking again, most often, or kiting, running away, flying off to a different target, in the case of, say, a devil, all very good stuff, right? So the Sentinel Automaton is has this kind of combo thing going on. Now, is he quite as amazing value for money as a Harpy would be or a Cerberus in terms of priority? Am I desperate to do this ASAP as much as these? Maybe not quite, but that's before you also need to factor in, which we haven't yet, the impact of the repair from the engineers. So what I found myself doing uh, with the factory so far with Sentinels in particular is using them kind of like a makeshift vampire lord, which we have up here. You run around the map attacking things with no retaliation. If the enemy attacks you and you take damage, you can intentionally put these guys out there as the sacrificial lamb to take damage. And then towards the end of the combat, you can tidy things up with a massive repair from your engineers. And you've kind of achieved the same thing that the vampire lords uh, would have achieved. So I think these guys are really, really strong. I think they're a high priority um, I found them to be a high priority. You can build automatons without armadillos. You don't need an armadillo pen. You can go straight to automatons from engineers, which is also very, very nice. So I think these upgraded guys, again, they do have the detonation ability, but I haven't figured out how to leverage that properly because you can't even invoke an enemy into retaliating because of the no retaliation thing. So there's a there's a challenge there in getting the best out of that uh, detonation feature, I think, for the Sentinels. All told, I think these are an A-grade unit, uh, something I'm really eager to do. And together, I found these two guys were like strawberries and cream, absolutely just go together really, really well. I love the artwork of the Angel so much, I don't actually want to mask him. Uh, so I'll put... The... <laughs> I like him. I like. He kind of feels like he's the representative of the whole group, you know, being at, at, at the head here. So I'm going to put the automaton right up here next to the uh, the sentinel, right up against the uh, ne next to the engineer as well. 
As for the basic guy, I think he probably does have more utility than I've been able to get from him so far. You will find applications, I'm sure, to leverage the detonation, and uh, he can do a good job for you while you're waiting for the money you need to upgrade, circle back to your town and get this guy. So similar to what we talked about before with the uh, mechanic, I think the um, basic automaton deserves a solid B as well. Now with the sandworms, I think the best comparison I could find for these, and the way it felt when I was playing the game, is to compare them to a minotaur. Kind of similar idea, you've got a 50 HP body, it actually goes up to 60 HP for the upgraded ones. These guys have flying and really solid attack, defense, damage, the kind of thing that you're quite happy investing money in and getting them to walk out or burrow out, it's not flying, it's actually burrowing, burrowing out to the middle of the, the park and getting mixed up in fights and dealing good damage. You don't really want to trade their bodies, but if you have to, you have to, that's kind of, they're, they're doing a job for you. They're flexible, useful units for that purpose. Um, I did find the upgraded ones to be better uh, value for money. I was more excited about getting to them quickly, so I think these guys are going to outrank the, the basic sandworm. Uh, now, in addition, the upgraded ones have this corpse devour ability, which, again, I'm just learning. Uh, I don't think I was able to leverage as well as I'm, I'm meant to. Uh, where they can land on a hex and devour a corpse in order to gain additional attacks like a crusader um, but it's a one-shot effect so after you've devoured the corpse you get one extra attack the next time you attack so there are going to be ways to you know really really leverage that uh, that i think if i be completely honest i'm probably still learning um, overall really really solid unit um, the other thing i wanted to mention about them as well and I, there was i was just thinking there there's another thing you don't have to have the automatons. You can skip the automaton dwelling, go straight from armadillos into the sandworms. And in a way, you've got, kind of got two trees in the factory, two different build trees. You can either go the biological, zoological path, armadillos into sandworms, or you can go the mechanical route of engineers into automatons. Um, now, so where are we going to rank these? Yeah, I feel like it's it's there's a lot of analogies to the minotaurs. You know, the upgraded one really solid good high priority creature i'm gonna to want to do that I, I want him up here in this b plus region alongside the kings i think the basic sandworm similarly to a normal minotaur is probably a little bit better uh, with the flying has a little bit more utility than the uh basic minotaur would have so i think that's where i like the uh, sandworms and i've just made a slight tweak to the sizing of the creatures in the front rank in the foreground here the Picture's going to get pretty busy by the time we've added all the cove and all that kind of thing as well. Uh, so hopefully that's still coming okay for you guys, uh, coming through okay for you in terms of the graphic. All right, now where are we up to? We've got to move on to tier six. It's time to talk about gunslingers and bounty hunters. Now my story so far with these units is I've been really excited and pumped to get these guys going and start fighting with them because I love the flavor. The idea with these guys is they are very, very good at dealing damage from uh, distance. Like a lot of other units in the game. Uh, the gimmick is, the special angle is that they can't really be shot by enemy archers. Okay, so when they're facing off against an enemy stack of archers, they have a preemptive shot. The gunslinger will actually fire his weapon first before the enemy, let's say it's a lich, actually attacks him. Okay. Uh, so you're really discouraged from shooting uh, these guys uh, with your own uh, archer units. The bounty hunter then is able to preemptively shoot any number of different archers that might be shooting him. Okay. Now, what 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 is the con to that? Like, what's the what what, what what's my sacrifice here? Well, unfortunately, the sacrifice is pretty big. They're a tier six unit with forty five HP. Now, for a tier 6 unit, that's really, really bad. Uh, they're extremely squishy. And I found that they're just not really a tenable unit in the way that they actually um, slot into your army. You cannot attack an enemy castle, uh, an enemy town, while packing these guys. They will be murdered by the arrow towers because they can't preemptively shoot the arrow towers. Um, in addition to that, Okay, I can't shoot them, but I can still melee them. I can just fly over with some good quality melee unit, a harpy hag. Or, well, actually, harpy hags aren't as good, but you know what I mean, like uh, any melee unit, really. Uh, heck, even in a firefight with Grand Elves, I could walk over with my Grand Elves and melee you. 
um, instead of shooting you. I mean, I don't know if that's a thing or not. Probably, you would expect these guys to win in that in that type of engagement, I guess. Um, but yeah, I just I've unfortunately not found them to be practical. The bounty hunter's upgrade, he gets okay an upgrade to whatever damage and stuff, and then being able to do it to any number of enemy archers, that's just going to be such a corner case. It's going to come up so rarely that uh, I really don't think he adds much more at all uh, to, to to the power level of the exi of, of the starting point, which is is quite um, is quite poor, I think. So gunslingers, I actually have found so far to be something I don't want to invest in and I don't want to buy. And so that means they're not even actually qualified to be a D. I think the gunslinger is an E. Um, I might say he's an okay E. He's a bit better than... I was quite mean to ghost dragons here, actually, wasn't I? Um, I think he's somewhere in this neighborhood. He's worse than an imp. I'll buy imps and use them for longer, um, more often, or a bone dragon more often than I will a, uh, a gunslinger. I think that's true. I think that's the case. I think that's how I feel about them. The upside isn't enough. If it would be different if they had two shots, something like the marksman, or they did ma like unfair levels of damage when they when they just shot someone with their amazing uh, looking rifles. But the damage just is okay for the gold that you spend. It's not a broken amount of damage that they do when they when they shoot. Um, the bounty hunter. Okay, I've got to pay to upgrade the dwelling and pay to upgrade the guys and the extra point, the gold coins per model. What do I get for my money? An extra preemptive shot, like an infinite number of preemptive shots against enemy archers, doesn't do anything to address the shortcomings of the HP. These guys are an absolute glass cannon, I think, and just a very low priority for me. Um, I don't think I can put him there because my camera is going to be in the way. Um, I think he's, I think he's an, he's a bad E, the bounty hunter. We have the Kotal. I'm going to pronounce that uh, the word Kotal. Uh, the basic one here on the left, and the upgraded Crimson Coatl. Coatl? Coatl? Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'm going to say Coatl. Coatl. Uh, for both. The Crimson Coatl. Now, what do we get for our money here? Uh, first things first, the basic one, to get the dwelling, you can skip past Gunslingers and the Watchtower. You can go straight from Sandworms up to these Tier 7 units, Coatls, and that's quite good. The dwelling is not very expensive. What do you get for uh, your money in terms of buying the unit? I like to think of these almost perfectly exactly as a flying Hydra. They have almost the same stats as a basic Hydra, which uh, the basic ones are down here uh, in E+. However, um, what are the cons and pros and cons and minuses and pluses compared to the Hydra? Well, instead of having no enemy retaliation and attacking all the hexes around it, what the Coatl can do is fly and uh, have movement 11. And movement is absolutely king in this game. In addition to that, you have this thing where you can switch on once per combat an invulnerability rule, but if you do that with the Coatl, you can't attack. So all he can do is sit where he is and be invulnerable. Yeah, overall, I think that he's way more flexible and powerful than a Hydra, but the damage the damage output per gold coin spent is okay. You do feel him, you, you do feel that it's a basic tier seven unit. It doesn't feel, he doesn't deal insane damage the way that an angel does uh, for a basic tier seven unit. Sheer damage output of something like the angel just isn't quite there with the coatl. So he's not an absolute no brainer, have to get him ASAP, but he's a good solid investment. Um, I think you can, um, you can be happy investing in these and getting some good payoff from them. So we'll move him into the B tier, I think. Um, it is getting a bit busy up there, but we'll find a home for him up there uh, at some stage in a moment. I'll fix the formatting. In terms of the Crimson Coatl, well, you get uh, a nice upgrade to most of the things that matter. You only get as far as 200 HP, though, uh, and we've got other tier 7s here that are 300 or at least 250, so that's quite a low HP point to be upgrading to only 200 for the Crimson one. The invulnerability clause changes though, you can now attack, fly over with uh, your high speed, attack and then turn your invulnerability on all at the same time, and that has a lot more utility, it's a lot more useful. The cost of the dwelling to upgrade though is quite pricey. We're talking 15k and 20 crystal to make that upgrade. Is it really worth it? I, I think it kind of is. But I think maybe the basic ones are going to have a little bit more utility in terms of value for money for longer. 
than the upgrade is. The upgrade's fine, you can be happy doing that. But I think these guys are a little bit ahead, the basic ones are a little bit ahead for, for me in terms of attractiveness. Okay, so we found a home for them up here um, in the in the B rankings. Solid, but I, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, a solid good choice. And just a tiny bit more formatting there to uh, hopefully improve the visual experience. Uh, now, we aren't done with the factory though. There is another tier seven dwelling and separate uh, upgradable tier seven creature, the Dreadnought and the Juggernaut. Okay, so what do we do here with these guys? Well, firstly, how do we get, how, how did we get here? In order to build the gantry where you can recruit Dreadnoughts and Juggernauts, you need the Watchtower first. You need to go through Gunslingers and, and not Bounty Hunters, but you do need to get the Watchtower before you can actually build the gantry. In addition, the gantry wants lots of crystal, the same way that the Serpentarium does uh, for the Codals. It's going to be difficult for you in most games, certainly resource-constrained games, the version I like to play of the game, to do both things, uh, certainly on time anyway. Now, in terms of how these units play, I haven't had a lot of experience with them yet, but my perception of them is very much uh, kind of a walking dragon. Um, picture a dragon that can't fly, but instead can walk, is an automatic uh, automaton, so with no morale, is repairable by the engineer, uh, which is, is a key, key benefit, and instead of fire breathing, swap the fire breathing over. Imagine you could just, instead of doing fire breathing, do one massive, ridiculous fire breathing every combat. Uh, and I think it's called the heat stroke ability where you can uh, sweep your fire breath uh, across multiple, ang uh, three hexes and uh, cook, uh, hopefully cook anyway, uh, a basket of perhaps two or even three enemies at the same time, depending on how well you are able to uh, set things up in the combat. The biggest problem though, that's all sounding okay. Okay, that's all sounding cool. The biggest problem really is for me the movement. The basic one is movement six. The upgraded one is movement seven. And I said before in the first video, we're taught we're, like Chaos Hydras have this problem for me. It's like movement is king. Movement is absolutely the king key statistic for virtue for me. Otherwise, it means, okay, you're powerful, but I have to massage. I have to haste you. I have to teleport you. I have to slow your enemies or figure out a way by which I'm going to leverage your abilities. In a siege, I have to somehow get you past, get you over the walls. I, I have to babysit you somehow in order to get the best out of you. So these guys for me are not in the same conversation as dragons, despite them having a kind of a similar virtue to dragons in a lot of ways. Um, huge beefy HP, um, big damage, fire breathing. I'd probably actually prefer heat stroke to fire breathing. I think it's probably more powerful. Um, to be able to do that one devastating shot um, instead of being fire breathing every turn. Um, but I'm just not going to be as excited to get these guys as quickly, especially given that I've got to go through gunslingers to get there. Often I'll find myself, I think, going for coatals instead. So where am I with these guys? I feel like it's a lingering sort of C. I don't think you could say that they're D. Uh, yeah, because you, you will get value from them in the late game if you've got that money, if you've got that crystal to invest, they'll pay you back and you'll 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 have um, a good return from them. Now, in terms of which one I like better, the investment that you've got to make in crystal and money is more or less the same. You, you pay it once, then you pay it a second time to get up to Juggernaut. But the basic one already has movement six and uh, heat stroke. You do get a, a buff to attack and defense and uh, a HP pump as well, though for the upgrade. I think overall, the basic one probably does uh, give you a better yield uh, per gold coin spent than the upgraded one. That doesn't mean you're, not, you're never doing the upgrade. You, 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 there's going to be a point in the game where the money and the crystal, crystal's not a problem. I've got like 80 crystal, like it's not a problem. Okay, fine. Um, in the round though, over the course of many, many fights and many, many campaigns, maybe the basic one gives a, just that little bit more um, utility. Okay, and we are done with the factory and we're ready to move on to the cove. Now the cove town outdates the factory by uh, some years uh, and I have a bit more experience playing with these creatures. But with that said, I still don't have anywhere near as much experience as I have with the creatures from the vanilla game. So similar to what we were doing there with the factory creatures, I'm going to be drawing comparisons and analogies to other creatures that uh, I am more familiar with in order to help guide the um, ratings and rankings. So the first creature off the rank is the Nymph and Oceanid, and you can see them respectively left and right here at the bottom. 
And the way I like to think of the nymph is essentially the same as a pixie. It's very much based on the same idea as a pixie. Uh, the pixies are in here, behind here, behind the pit lord, pit fiends, as you can see. Now, in making the comparison, well, what are the comparisons? For starters, you can't uh, accelerate the nymphs the way you can with pixies, with the garden of life or whatever it is. You're stuck on 16 per week. Um, you can't uh, stockpile huge amounts of them uh, quickly. In addition to that, they are one hex slower than a pixie. Okay, so not like already feeling not really as good as a pixie, and a pixie isn't even that good. Um, what do you get? Well, you get plus three attack. Instead of having two attack, they have five attack, and that actually makes a really big difference. When they hit, it's a noticeable punch in the face, and that's true across a lot of these creatures in the code we're going to be talking about. High damage output capabilities are the name of the game uh, when it comes to Cove. I just adjusted the lighting there. Hopefully it uh, wasn't too glaring for you guys. Um, that's great and all, but <sighs> high damage is nice, and they're annoying to fight against. They're actually quite scary in the early game sometimes in, big po in, in, in large numbers if you aren't able to quickly kill them. But they're so squishy. I mean, they're as squishy as a pixie, one heck slower. I just don't find myself getting really excited about getting tons of them early in the game. You'll have the dwelling, so the dwelling is there at the beginning of the game. How eager am I to buy them every single turn, um, every single week, all the way through the early game? Not that excited. And in contrast to the uh, pixie, when you upgrade the pixie, you go to the sprite, which in the vanilla game is insane. The sprite will be moving later, though, because of the balance changes we'll come to uh, due to Horn of the Abyss. Um, so getting to pixies and stockpiling them early, buying tons of them, yeah, 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 that, that's a big priority because I want to get to these as quickly as possible. That's not really true with the ocean. Yeah, the ocean, it moves faster. It does more damage than a sprite will deal. Um, but again, it doesn't have that no retaliation feature. Movement eight, I think, for the ocean, it, it's just okay. They're going to die in droves as soon as the opponent kind of turns their gaze toward them. So I just don't actually think these are a high priority. You can spend your money on them, they're not very expensive, but you're not expecting the world from them. So I think it's a D plus. Okay, so I found a spot for the two girls there. I think the basic one's better value for money than investing in the upgrade and getting the oceaned. So that's how I feel about that. I have to be a little bit harsh, otherwise everyone's just going to end up in the B uh, all the time, which is no good. These guys aren't a big priority for me. Okay, who's next? Okay, the next is level two creature in the cove, which is the crewmate and the upgraded crewmate, as I'll, uh, as I'll call this fellow here in the stripes. I actually struggled a little bit to find a good comparator for the crewmate in the rest of the game. They've kind of got a bit of everything going on. They're a little bit like a gargoyle, a little bit like a harpy uh, in the way that they fight, the, in terms of the movements that you get out of them. I find that um, they're actually a really high priority for me when I play the cove, however, because their baseline stats are just really sort of solid across the board, almost everywhere except for defense in the case of the basic crewmate. In addition to that, you get the pub, um, which is the horde building um, that allows you to get large numbers of crewmates quite early on in the game. And they're really stodgy, solid guys. You can just count on them to walk up, fight, kind of like what I was saying before about gargoyles. If some of them die in response, well, that's OK. That's kind of your job. Um, I found actually when I was playing in the, the campaign uh, of the Cove as well that they kind of serve this role they get in the way of things in particular get in the way of pirates sea dogs and that kind of thing we'll talk about in a moment and uh sort of exchange blows but they deal good solid damage in response as well when you upgrade them you get an upgrade to just about everything um attack defense damage all the rest of it speed as well um but the defense upgrade is plus two they go up all the way to six defense from four which really improves their survivability uh, big, solid stats on these guys for an upgraded Tier 2 unit. I think because the nymphs aren't very good, and this is what happens with the zombies, by the way, and uh, the whole thing about whites being so terrible, and when the, the creatures in the town nearby you aren't that great, your rating will naturally go up because the pri my priority for, for getting you online will be that much higher. I think the upgraded crewmate is very, very solid and highly desirable, kind of in this B-plus region. The basic guy, I think you can get away with um, using it instead for a while, but I do want to get that upgrade pretty pretty urgently. I think maybe the basic one is in the same conversation as the very tail end of the B uh, for him. 
and Maya, but it's getting busy in this uh, in this B tier as we can see here. Um, but yeah, no good creature. The the crewmate solid solid, and the horde dwelling really really helps. Okay, on to pirates. Now with the pirate, you've got this really unique thing going on where you can start with the um, frigate to get uh, the basic pirate. You can upgrade the pirates into corsairs. And then, uniquely, you can upgrade the Corsairs into an additional level of upgrade to Sea Dogs. And these guys are kind of like a level three and a half um, unit, if you like. In terms of ranking them, I found it a little bit difficult to find good comparators. When I first started playing as the Cove, I really was working on the assumption that pirates are the main meme of the town. It's a pirate town. I thought the pirates themselves are going to feel like Grand Elves when you're playing the game. You want to buy as many as possible, and they're a massive, massive priority. Uh, and you're going to upgrade them to, and Sea Dogs are going to be right up here in the S tier, along with uh, the, the best archers in the game, in terms of value for money. That's not quite right. I actually think the pirate, the basic pirate, one of his best comparators is the Evil Eye, uh, or Beholder, which is actually here, the basic Beholder. Now, when you compare these two guys, the pirate and the Beholder both have this thing where they have no melee penalty. In Horn of the Abyss, that's really important because... The player has the discretion to hold down the control key or hit the little sword icon, and instead of shooting when you have the discretion to shoot, you are able to walk around and use your no melee penalty instead, uh, which is a really, really nice feature uh, that the uh, developers have added to uh, Horn of the Abyss. Now, a pirate by comparison to a beholder has 15 HP instead of 22 HP. He's much easier to kill. He dies more easily. However, he deals more damage, 3 to 7 damage for an average of 5 instead of 3 to 5 damage for the Beholder, which is an average of 4. Um, by comparison, in terms of dwellings, you get the Pillar of Eyes. You can get that straight after um, uh, the Troglodytes. You don't need the Harpies. You can go straight there. Uh, the Pirates do require the Shack in, uh, as a comparison. In addition to that, the Pirates have 4 shots per combat. Beholders have 12. That's a problem. Four shots is going to bite. It's going to hurt, and you're going to have. It's going to cause a headache for you more often than only having twelve shots, which will almost always completely be enough for 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 any engagement. So, yeah, they're not grand elves. They're they're, they're more like for me a beholder. How important is it to get pirates going quickly in the cove? Well, I've actually found that you don't always have to do this. You can go from shack straight to Stormbirds, and Stormbirds are really, really solid creatures as well. I feel like, though, you do want to get the Frigate, and you do want to start collecting these guys and letting them build up, even if you aren't buying them as a, as a really high priority. I think the Pirate's a solid creature, particularly given the upside of being able to get to these higher tiers at your own discretion. They have a lot of option value that isn't there with certain other creatures. So how much of a priority is this? Yeah, it's better than C. But they're not A-grade units that I absolutely have to get ASAP every time I play the Cove. I do want to build the Dwelling pretty urgently. Um, so where should they land? I, I'm reticent to say, I think we're heading for the B-plus again um, for a basic pirate. Um, so let's put him there for now. And uh, yeah, we'll tidy up formatting. We'll have to think about how we're going to represent this now in a moment. Now, for the first level of upgrade, the Corsair, nice upgrade, good upgrade to uh, all of the key things that really matter, particularly both attack and defense. Both get a plus two buff. They get plus one speed, which is solid. Still stuck at 15 HP and still stuck at four shots per combat. So, yeah, good, but, oh, man, there's, it's, it comes with a little asterisk, right? Uh, the cost of the upgrade isn't insane, and uh, as long as you have a reasonable stack of pirates that you've either been saving up or you're circling back to the town, this will be an upgrade that you'll do with a pretty high degree of uh, probability, I think, um, especially in a resource-constrained game where it won't be possible necessarily to go straight from pirates to sea dogs, for reasons we'll talk about now in a second when we talk about the cost of sea dogs. So I think Corsairs are okay, but probably not as high up in terms of frequency of purchase priority compared to other units that maybe the original one is somewhere in this kind of uh, meandering solid b minus e sort of range for a corsair okay so we'll leave him there just uh, while we're trying to figure out what we do 
Now the sea dog is a really difficult one to rate. I went through so many different iterations in my mind thinking about how I was going to rank these guys. What the sea dog does first and foremost is upgrades itself from the Corsair into something that deals more damage with its higher attack skill, um, more speed, great, and it inherits this cool accurate shot ability which is very analogous to the mighty gorgons that we have here in B minus where if you have a large enough stack of sea dogs after they've shot something they'll then murder an additional whole unit of that stack so when you're shooting something that's tier 7 like a uh, I don't know an arch devil or um, a green dragon you get a whole extra kill from that effect which is extremely powerful and scary to go up against so you're tempted at first blush to say well aren't these guys similar to a mighty gorgon because in addition to that stuff i just said the cost of getting them is quite high in terms of dwelling you've got to invest in what's called the gunpowder warehouse which requires requires five of every resource i like three grand it's, it's quite an expensive uh dwelling to get online reminds me a lot with the mighty gorgons you've got to build the resource silo first which costs five grand before you can and that's why these guys are in b minus by the way because with value for money and priority that's a really big consideration. In addition, while the Mighty Gorgons have Death Stare and can do the same thing to an enemy tier 7 unit, that accurate shot can, the Mighty Gorgons are able to take care of themselves. And if they find themselves in melee one on one with a unit of devils, between Death Stare and their sheer chonky 70 HP, they're going to trade so well, you don't really have to babysit them. With the Sea Dogs, that's not really the case, right? If these devils get next to them, it's all over. There's no shooting, let alone survivability with 15 HP. You don't even get any more HP. That's the other thing when you upgrade them. So in a way, these guys wear down to looking a little bit like the old uh, mage and archmage from the tower, where you've got to find five of every resource to get these creatures online. And then they sit there with a moderately, I mean, these guys have 25 HP, so they're at 30 HP, I think, for this one. So they can fight with no melee penalty, decent HP, but you've got to find all these resources to get them online. And I don't like that, right, with the, in the case of mages and archmages. That's why they found themselves in D minus, because it's like, I want to do something else instead. They're, they're great. They're great on the field of, of battle, but too expensive and difficult for me to, to unlock. So now you're wearing back and saying, well, OK, what are these guys now? Are they D minus? I think what it all comes down to is that ultimately you have the discretion. You can play with pirates or corsairs well into week three, week four, as long as you want. OK. Or you can build the frigate and just leave it sitting there with these guys accumulating. When you're ready, you can get sea dogs. Okay, unlike the mages, you can't even get a basic mage started. You can't start saving them until you build the mage tower and find the five of every resource, which is just a headache. That's not a problem with these guys. Okay, whenever you've got the resources together and you want to make the investment, you can go ahead and do it. I do still feel like with 15 HP, these guys are getting lightning bolted so often. They're getting absolutely prioritized by the enemy. So it's like a halfling. How much utility will you really get for your investment from a sea dog? I don't actually think it'll turn out to be that much very often. I haven't found it to be that much when I've played the Cove over the last couple of years. Um, that said, you know, I you know it, there's nothing more satisfying than getting an accurate shot off and killing an extra Hydra or something. It's, 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 that's brilliant. Um, so there'll probably be some controversy around this because a lot of you guys out there will really love this unit, but I think they probably have less value for money and applicability and desirability in the round than the other two guys do. I don't have the heart to give them a C, but they're going to end up just a little bit behind, I think, the Corsairs in terms of value for money and uh, desirability. Okay, some more visual tweaks there. I'm getting concerned that you can barely tell what some of the guys in the back row even are. These are... Um, Hellhounds, and this is a Lizard Man. That's a basic Knoll Centaur Captain there, Halberdier, with the uh, original graphics from the first game uh, in the background there. So um, I might do a rethink on the graphics just before we finalize the video, but hopefully you guys can still see what everything's happening there. Uh, interested to see what you guys make of this with the three-way kind, of, kind of upgradable thing. Uh, and yeah, I think you, I, I did get fairly reasonable feedback on my point about the mages and archmages and their value for money, difficulty in unlocking. I don't think the same thing applies with the sea dogs, though, for those reasons I mentioned earlier. OK, let's keep moving. We're on to tier four and the stormbirds and acids. OK, and here they are. I often get these mixed up when I'm looking at the graphics in the game as to what I'm up against, whether it's the basic one or the upgraded one. 
basic storm bird is here on the left. And you've got here a really interesting creature. I think the most reasonable analogy would be to compare thee to a Pegasus, tier four flying creature. Now, how much better, if at all, is a storm bird than a basic Pegasus? A lot better, in my opinion, right? The storm bird is better than a Pegasus in almost every respect. Just about every single stat from attack, defense, speed, almost everything, it's got at least plus one better than uh, a Pegasus. And the upgrade to the Acid, the Acid, as we'll talk about in a second, is really strong, whereas the Silver Pegasus is not a very high priority for me when I'm playing as Rampart. So I'm quite eager to get this dwelling up and running. In addition, you can get there straight from the Shack, as I mentioned earlier. And on top of all of that, there is the Horde Dwelling, the roost, as uh, it's called, as uh, you can probably tell, I had to just go and look, look, look up what the heck it was actually called, means you can get seven creatures per week instead of five Pegasi per week. Start getting that stockpile working. Very, very good unit, highly desirable. Um, if I'm stuck using them for a while, I'll be happy. That again means we're in the B tier, which is... Uh, another quick tweak there as I realized the sandworms had been hidden there. Uh, yeah, that's a good, solid creature, the Stormbird. Probably I want to up, up in this conversation with basic vampires. Uh, let's move some things around here. So I'm experimenting with the third layer of foreground here, hopefully just for the B-plus range. Stormbirds here in their, their own little border in front of the behemoths and the Ifrit Sultans. I think that's better than trying to cram everything in on that second tier, but um, we'll see how that looks at the end. We might have to do a tweak. Now, in terms of the Acids, the Acids are great. They go right up to movement 11 and they gain this ferocious ability where if they kill something on their first attack, when they first attack it, and they then take a retaliation, let's say, they then also get to attack a second time the same way that a crusader would. So it's kind of like having the crusader ability, but with a slight uh, clause, a, 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 slight, kind of, a slight caveat on it. They're very, very good at punching down. If you're attacking at tier three, tier two stacks, that kind of thing, they're almost certainly going to trigger that ferocious attack. Because of the effect of the roost and all of that other stuff, the fact that their little brothers are already quite strong as well, I think the Acid is a great value investment and a really high priority. Part of the reason why I find my money going in towards getting these, um, but that's part of the reason why the pirates just aren't quite at that A tier of uh, priority for me instead. So I think the Acid belongs up in this sort of A minus category. Um, good solid unit, yeah, kind of same conversation as a rock, you know, in the terms of the functionality of what it does. Thunderbird, really, really strong solid unit as well. Has nowhere near the HP, obviously, as a, as a Thunderbird. But the two attacks thing, high damage, high output uh, creature that you can be quite happy uh, investing in. Okay, solid A minus for the Acid, and we're on to tier five to talk about Sea Witches and Sorceresses. And so the best analogy for these that I can think of is the Lich and Power Lich. In the Necropolis here, we, you can see the uh, Power Lich is here. The basic Lich is here. Tier 5, powerful ranged attacker. What are the key differences and similarities? Well, the comparison's actually really, really close with the Sea Witch having poorer defense than a Lich, but higher HP. But there's not really very much in it. In terms of the sheer amount of damage they deal when they attack, comparable. The Lich has this AoE effect of the Death Cloud, now which we'll be talking about by the way in a moment in relation to the changes to the way that the game works in HD mode or in Horn of the Abyss mode compared to vanilla mode. Instead of the AoE attack, what the Sea Witch will do is cast weakness on whoever she just shot. I have found that to be really good, really really useful, and then if she's hitting them in subsequent rounds she'll do Disrupting Ray instead of weakness. And that's, that's really, really nice. So you have the sort of upside option with these uh, girls of playing them in small stacks instead of massive stacks in order to get those weakness triggers off uh, early, which is a, is a nice sort of tactical option that you have as the player. So we're in the same conversation as the Lich, I think, for, for Sea Witches. Sorceresses are worth the upgrade. Again, similar cost profile in terms of dwellings and cost per model to the upgraded Power Lich. I think these are a really good uh, high priority. In addition, you can go straight from the shack to the dwelling, to the uh, Sea Witch and Sorceress dwelling, uh, which is very, very good. That means they're extremely accessible, even maybe more so than the uh, mausoleum. I can't remember now if you need the vampire dwelling for the mausoleum. Um, uh, so yeah, like high priority. I think these are an A-grade unit. 
they gel nicely with the uh, crewmates that will be happily uh, used to body block and defend them. Uh, they pair pretty well with the uh, acids, although not as well as, you know, um, something like a black knight uh, pairs with, with a lich, but that's it from a different uh, tier anyway. All in, all in all told, I think these are A-grade units, both of them, the basic one and the upgraded one. We will also be moving the Power Lich up to the A rank uh, for reasons we'll explain later as well. Uh, as for which one's better, hmm, I think the upgraded one is better because it's practically, it's almost the exact same cost per model. It's a very small, like less than 10% upgrade to the cost per model and the cost of the dwelling isn't much and you do get a nice uplift to damage range and plus one movement as well. Uh, so still constantly making formatting tweaks as I go here. Uh, yeah, and as I say, the, uh, the, the liches do need a, um, a revisit as well, um, for reasons we'll talk about now in a moment. Right, we're getting there. We've got two tiers left in the cove. We've got the Nyx and Nyx Warriors next. So these guys are absolutely fascinating and interesting to rate and rank. As opposed to the other creatures in the cove, these guys are exceptionally defensive-minded, uh, and I'm almost tempted to compare them, actually, to a unicorn. They have a similar uh, stat line in terms of damage output, HP, that kind of thing. However, if I start with the Nyx Warrior here, the upgraded one, they have this unique ability, which is that incoming attacks are nerfed by 60%. So whether it's being shot by an enemy archer, whether it's being attacked by an enemy melee unit, the incoming attack strength is deleted by 60%. It's not deleted by 15 or by minus 10. It's a percentage haircut. Now, in the late game, that can have massive consequences when both heroes of, of, on the fight are adding 15 or 20 attack to all of the units. You can end up with this bizarre scenario where this guy might have, you know, I don't know, 35 defense, and the attack that's coming in from a chunky good unit uh, is reduced to, like, five or something, or like, insanely reduced. Um, and that makes them really, really powerful. They can punch well above their weight. They can fight against tier seven units all day long, melee, one-on-one, -on -one, not a problem. In the same way, same breath as Mighty Gorgons um, and that, that, that kind of thing. Okay, which is really, really good. So great value for money, standing in front of sorceresses, even splitting them into stacks of two, using them uh, for that sort of functionality. Very, very handy, good, solid unit. Um, you might teleport them, um, you might haste them, if the enemy doesn't have any way to deal with them, they can almost feel like the same thing that happens with magic elementals, where it's like, oh, I don't have a way to deal with this unit. What am I going to do? I have to fight it fairly? It's just going to print so much value in a fair fight. But that's where the asterisk comes in, right, for these guys. They can be blinded and they can be imploded, right? They have no resistance to magic uh, that, you know, they don't give any of the incoming magic damage uh, a haircut. There is, however, interference is kind of a theme in the cove, and if you pair these guys with interference to stop the damage of incoming damage spells, you've got a really nice combo on your hands. So I think the next warrior is great, a very, very good unit. Um, I have to kind of almost choose between like my priorities and my desperately trying to get to these guys. Are they an A-grade unit? Hmm. Yeah, I think they are. I think they're up in this conversation like a Naga Queen. How happy are you to get a Naga Queen stack going? You're willing, right? You're going to go to Nagas. You're going to skip them, go go for the upgrade, and just buy the Queens because of just how good they are. There's so much utility in them. And it feels the same with the Nyx Warrior. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get these guys, get them deployed early. Um, a minus for a Nyx, a Nyx Warrior. Very, very good return on investment. As for the basic guys here at the bottom, still uh, waiting for a rating, the haircut they give to incoming attacks is 30%, and that's a noticeable difference. They are still a nuisance to deal with, but I don't know if I really want to be fighting with them for very long. I want to upgrade them pretty urgently. So I think I'll probably put them somewhere in the C plus region. I'm not going to give them that B minus status of being a little brother of someone great, which I sort of have been doing to this point. I think these guys just fall off the, a little bit more. We're probably down in this region here. So we're on an absolute flyer here. We're nearly done. We've got one tier seven and its upgrade left, the Sea Serpent and the Haspid. The closest creature I could find to really compare the Sea Serpent to was the Ancient Behemoth, but it's not, sorry, the Normal Behemoth, but it's not a great comparison. So they're a lot more expensive per model than a basic Behemoth. They have plus three movement and more attack. 
but the behemoth has that 40 percent damage reduction feature which means the amount of damage they're dealing will often probably be comparable so they're more expensive but more mobile and flexible in addition to that, they have this poisoning uh, thing going on, which the Wyvern Monarchs have. I didn't talk much about the poisoning when I talked about Wyvern Monarchs in the first video. I don't really feel like poison is an amazing ability on creatures that want to move swiftly over and murder stuff in a single swipe. Um, Wyvern Monarchs, I don't want a big protracted three-turn uh, melee encounter against an enemy stack with my Wyvern Monarchs. Not, no thank you. Uh, and that's where poison really shines, right? What I want to do is fly over, murder the stack, and then fly off and do something else. Now, okay, the fact I'm also poisoning the residual creature that is still alive after I've attacked, that's useful, it's upside. But it's not massively great. Whereas if, it, if Basilisks had the poison attack, now you're talking, because that's a creature that wants to walk out, get involved in a protracted contest, uh, and, you know, poison would really have a, a bigger upside there, I think, for something like a basilisk. Yeah, so poison doesn't, venomous or whatever, that ability doesn't really massively excite me. I do feel, though, that um, this uh, creature has enough going for it in terms of flexibility and power level. Again, though, it's a high damage unit. You want to be pairing it with your acids to really get over there, use tactics, get over and get that damage dealt quickly, because if it's a long protracted fight, you know, it's not going to be as fun a time for you. Although, ironically, poison does work better um, as, as time goes on, uh, as the fight goes long. So, uh, it's a B for the serpent. Uh, and I'm saying, uh, because I just don't really have room for him. I'm going to figure out a way to do that now in a second. Um, a good solid B for the sea serpent. High priority, but uh, if I don't get there immediately, it's not the end of the world. And, yeah, we're not quite in this in, in this kind of A, a, a rank category, I don't think, for the sea serpent. As for the Haspid upgrade, you get additional movement to speed 12 and a huge uh, buff to HP, all the way up to 300 HP, and the damage output remains kind of the same. Um, so it's a bit like what happens between Angels and Archangels, where the amount of damage that the basic one deals when it's left alone to do that damage is all, it's on most of the damage, it's quite a lot of the damage that you will be getting out of the Haspid. In addition to that, the cost of upgrading the dwelling is, is not uh, the cheapest in the world. Um, that additional three moves, though, movement 9 to movement 12, really will make a big difference. I think you will get good utility out of upgrading them to Haspids. Um, I, it's not a massive priority for me, though, towards the late game. It'll often be the case that, like with the Ancient Behemoth we talked about in the first video, I will be returning to the him, him now in a moment, by the way, the Ancient Behemoth. But it's like, well, I could upgrade this creature or i could go over to one of these boutique upgrades where i've got other towns that i've conquered and make these guys instead you know oops hang on i've just moved the black dragon sacrilegious so yeah i think the haspid upgrade is a fine upgrade um i would not object at all to uh, you making that a priority uh, and it's something I, I i would do um towards the late game depending on how covey my final composition is Assuming I've started the game as the cove most often. So I think it's probably a solid C for the uh, Haspid. And I just made a couple of tweaks to that B rank, have uh, introduced a few more creatures into that foreground third level. I don't know graphically how this will turn out on YouTube, and if you're on a tiny mobile device, my apologies, but there are so many creatures I just really wanted to give a B. And so uh, that's kind of how that panned out. So now we have all of the creatures to date uh, as things stand at version 1.7 of Horn of the Abyss on the tier list. We aren't done though, right, because second phase of the video now, which is in the Horn of the Abyss, the developers have made some downright changes to the cost of some of the creatures, but critically also to the build path of how easy it is to unlock the creatures and get them going, as well as introduce these functional elements to combat which also affect the uh, desirability and usefulness of the creatures. So the first town to get a makeover in the balances uh, for the Horn of the Abyss is the Tower. Now the list is pretty long of things they've changed. The first and most important one, I think, is that the Mage Tower dwelling, it's still difficult to build. It's a little bit cheaper. It's actually down to only two grand instead of two and a half grand, but you still need five of every resource. But the key thing now is that you no longer need to build it before 
getting the genies, uh, Altar of Wishes, or the uh, Pavilion for the Nagas. You can actually skip these guys and go to Tier 5, 6, and 7 without building them at all. And that's a really, really big change. It gives a lot more flexibility. Okay. Now, the upgraded Altar to get the Master Genies now requires uh, the Mage Guild and the basic altar to have been, been uh, built, but that's fine. That's a ex very acceptable swap for not having to worry about the mage tower in the first place. The altar itself is now two and a half grand, um, down from three grand, as well as the other resources that you have to find. And the upgraded cloud temple to get to Titans is five grand cheaper, down to 20 grand from 25 grand. And quite importantly as well, the golem factory is down to 1500 gold from 2000 gold. Uh, as well as the resources it would normally require. So there's quite a bit going on there. In general, things are cheaper, things are easier, things are more flexible. So all of the creatures that are kind of um, hostage to the Mage Tower uh, require a, a review, I think. One other key thing that we'll come back to now when we talk about giants in a moment is that there's a new adventure map item called the uh, Golem Factory. And when you go to the Golem Factory, you have to fight Steel Golems, and if you beat them, the prize is Giants. So now we have a situation where, like Angels, uh, like Wyverns, you can go out into the Adventure Map and um, start collecting these creatures before you get the Cloud Temple, which is quite powerful. So what's the net effect of everything? Well, what needs to move? I think from the point of view of... Well, let's actually start with Genies and the Altar of Wishes. How easy it is now to get those Genies going, I think massively buffs their desirability and their, their usefulness. Um, yeah, I think the basic genie can easily go to uh, a solid C, if not uh, C plus-ish, in terms of its desirability. I still don't think they're particularly amazing on the field of battle, but uh, for the money and hassle of getting them uh, online, you don't need uh, the prerequisites now. You don't, you don't need those uh, former tier uh, dwellings in order to get them started. So they're a lot more viable. Okay, I'll fix up his formatting now in a moment. As for the Master Genie, well, they are now really, really fun and useful. They also, something I didn't dwell on very much in the first video is the fact that you can get a lot of utility from Master Genies without buying all of them. If you just have five or six, you can spread them around into single stacks and get the spellcasting uh, benefit uh, right out of the gate. So that's really, really powerful. I think the Master Genie probably belongs more in the... A minus E, B plus E category now as a result of those changes. So yeah, I think I'm still a bit too proud and stubborn to give him a full A minus sort of ranking. Um, maybe the more I play uh, Horn of the Abyss in this mode, in tower mode, the, the, the more I'll increasingly come to like him. But I do think because of that fact that you don't have to buy all of them um, means that, yeah, uh, are they going to be a massively high priority? Are oh, they going to be a pretty big priority? But um I think I'm happy enough with, with B plus for now. The changes that have been made to the accessibility of the Cloud Temple are immense, and coupled with the introduction of the Golem Factory, I think Giants are far more of a priority now for the Tower player, for me as a Tower player, than they were before. More than a Naga Queen? Yes, actually. I think these guys are really, really good and uh, a very, very high priority. Great value for money. They absolutely wreck on the field. They, they deal so much damage for a basic tier 7, similar to the Angel in terms of the amount of carnage they'll, they'll cause. Okay, movement 7. You know, they don't necessarily have all the virtues in, in the world, but they're a really, really good thing to pour your money into, I think, as the tower player. The Titans, I think, inherit some of the stardom uh, that you get. Like, you're that much closer to getting the upgraded Cloud Temple you're going to be that much more invested in wanting to do so. So I actually think that the Titans also deserve a small promotion to just acknowledge that point. So I've moved Titans up there. As I said, uh, Liches will be getting moved now in a second as well. Now, before we finish up with the tower, I need to return to Iron Golems. These were a mistake in the first video, I think. I use on Iron Golems all the time. Like, they're a really important unit. I prioritise getting them unlocked quite quickly, primarily because of the fact that I'm stuck here with this problem. I, made a, I mean, I made a massive fuss about the Archmages and Mages, and as a couple of people pointed out, it's like, well, yeah, but man, doesn't that then mean that Iron Golems are a really big priority and great value for money? So these guys didn't deserve a D-plus in the first video. 
On top of that, they're now even easier to get. The dwelling is cheaper to build than it was before. Um, because of the way the changes have worked with genies being more accessible now, we can get there quickly, get up into Nagas more quickly. I don't want to teleport them up to A or anything, but I really feel like um, the Iron Golem deserves acknowledgement as a really solid B tier unit um, and one that probably should have been in the B tier right from the beginning. I think it's a high B. Uh, it's a high priority. They, you know, I'll buy almost all of them a lot of the time all the way through that mid-game. Will I stop buying them towards the end of the game, the late game? Yeah, probably. Um, but they're going to tend to still be alive well into the late game and still useful um, so often as well. So I found a home for them up here in um, slightly B-, minus, but uh, hopefully that's, that's, that's not too far away from where he really uh, does deserve to be. And I think that's it for the changes to the tower. Now, the next town on the list that received a major injection of assistance was the Inferno. And even though the guys didn't buff all the creatures or make them all immune to fire magic or, or, or anything like that, one critical thing they did was introduce the ability for the player to select a hex on the ground to target with liches and with magogs. So you no longer have to pick an enemy creature and allow the magogs fireball to incinerate whatever uh, creatures are engaged with that enemy and sort of suck that up. You can target a hex on the ground next door to the target that you want to kill, and that massively changes the viability of Magogs. Um, by the way, in addition, I think with release 1.7, and I don't know if this is true of previous versions of Horn of the Abyss, I have observed the AI using this uh, ability, which is magnificent that the guys have taken their time to actually teach the AI to level up and use that new functionality. They haven't just given the player the ability to do it. The AI will do it as well. How important, how much of a priority is it to get to Magogs and start using them early in the game, in the campaign, as Inferno? Well, Imps and Familiars kind of stink. Demons are just okay. Cerberus are really, really strong. Um, these guys are going to be massive. Now, you can get away with Gogs. That will still be true for a long time, all the way through the early game and into the beginning of the mid-game if you have to. But this will be a massive priority now. These guys deal great damage, and you have the AoE upside of being able to hit more than one unit at a time, and you never have to incinerate your own troops anymore. So I'll confess, I haven't actually played as the Inferno in this format yet with Magog switched on, but I am brimming with like glee at the excitement at, excitement at the possibility of, at the prospect of doing so. I expect Magogs to be right up there as a very, very high priority uh, purchase. Do I think they're going to be more exciting and relevant well into the long game, you know, as these other two units from the Inferno? Probably not. Um, I think the excitement and priority factor will be somewhere down in this region here, but these will be an A-grade unit, in my opinion. So new home for the Magogs here up in the A tier, which is amazing. And by the way, what an amazing addition to the game to uh, unlock that ability for us to choose which hex these AOE archers are able to target. Really, really good, uh, sensible thing for the guys to have prioritized, I think. Okay, so that's Inferno. Now, before we move on from Inferno, I do just want to give a nod to Pit Lords. I They, they have actually changed the build order, so you no longer need a, need a level 2 mage guild. You can just get away with a level 1 mage guild to get these guys started and you can begin your demon farming strategy if you have an opportunity to do that with the creature stacks that are nearby. Um, raising demons, taking them back, converting them to horn demons, using your pit lords. I didn't really acknowledge that strategy enough in the first video either, and so I think the pit lord actually does deserve a promotion. How often will I prioritize it? Probably not as much as I should and as much as maybe some of you might do. Um, but I am going to have to acknowledge these guys as being better than just a, a plain C. I think I'm going to make room for them here in the B uh, category. And so the next key change we want to talk about is to the Necropolis. And we're really zooming in here on the impact that the change that I just talked about with Magogs has had on Liches. Not only can the Liches target anywhere on the ground, so the AI or the opponent cannot sort of stagger their units in a way to avoid the Death Cloud. It's very, very difficult to avoid giving your opponent a, uh, a death cloud opportunity now. But in addition, the mausoleum itself is even cheaper to build. I actually don't know why they, why, why they chose to make this uh, cheaper, but the cost is down from 10 stone and sulfur down to five 
stone and four sulfur. So see, it's, it's even easier to get the mausoleum going in the first place. In addition to all of that, I had actually neglected in the first video, I'd sort of said at the time, oh, you can upgrade them to power liches, but it's not really worth it. You get a little bit more speed. You also get, what I didn't say, you also get 40 HP instead of 30. It's a huge increase from 30 HP to 40 HP for the power lich. And uh, in my last run through as uh, Necropolis, um, you know, I, I, I think I realized that. Or, um, I don't know if I called it out in the video as such, but the power lich is a worthy upgrade and it should probably be above the basic lich. The cost of upgrading the mausoleum is not much, and uh, especially getting uh, to the getting the dwelling up in the Horn of the Abyss mode is also um, a, another animal. So these guys are moving, and there's a question of where they're moving to. The new functionality alone means that the Lich, I think, is more up in this category here. He is A+. Plus. Okay, Vampire Lords are still the boutique unit that I just cannot wait to get going on when I'm playing as the... Uh, Necropolis, but Basic Lich is awesome now, such a high priority, cheap, easy mausoleum, and uh, let me get that AoE attack online as quickly as I can. The Power Lich, as I said, belongs above him. It's so worth it to upgrade. Viability now in the mid game, high priority in the late game, amazing, insane attack, solid beefy body with HP 40... I think we might be creeping into the special region. The Power Lich is a really special unit now. Um, I, well, I think it's at least... I don't know if it's really special. It's special, special, special. It doesn't to totally break the, open the game and just destroy it uh, the way that um, you, you, you can do in the vanilla game with some of these five units we're talking about here. But uh, great, great unit. Incredible. Um, better than a Wyvern? I think Wyverns really, if they're special because of the reasons I explained in the first video, they're probably the worst of the specials um, due to that accessibility point, um, the ability to get these things working quickly and get uh, start collecting them is, is the reason that they're in the special uh, category, the value for money that you get. They're better than a Wyvern, right? These guys. In terms of uh, how, how, how eager I am to make this unit and start using it. Um, yeah, and the basic guys, similar, like really, really high up, A+. plus, Fantastic unit now, the Lich and the Power Lich. Okay, moving on to the dungeon, actually. There's a couple of things I just want to acknowledge here. Because we now have the option to, when we uh, have an archer unit that has the opportunity to shoot that's not engaged in melee, in the vanilla game, you have to shoot. In the Horn of the Abyss, you can push a melee button, and walk up to something and melee it instead. Now, normally with something like a marksman or a grand elf, you're never going to want to do that. But with something like a beholder, uh, you might, because it has no melee penalty, and you might want to reposition the beholder while attacking. Interestingly as well, with the medusas and the medusa queens, you have the upside potential of petrifying the target after you've attacked it. And if you're in a desperate enough situation and your medusa stack is small enough, you might decide, actually, that rather than shoot my arrows with these three Medusas, I'm going to walk up and attempt to petrify that nasty stack of whatever, devils or something. And that's a nice uh, upside and utility for the Medusas. I don't think it's enough to massively move the needle and make me want to promote them to C or anything. I don't think I really want to move them uh, out of the region that they're in. But I just did want to acknowledge uh, those effects on those two creatures. Um, there's one other impact, uh, one other delta or change the guys have made to, to Dima as a hero. They've taken away his scouting or made it a basic instead of advanced scouting. That won't affect, um, you know, the attractiveness of the town very much, but uh, certainly rebalances things for uh, PvP uh, and, uh, and that kind of thing. I might also just mention as well that Harpy Hags now have the ability, Harpies and Harpy Hags, instead of striking and returning, here's the basic one, um, instead of striking and returning, you have the choice. You can strike and remain. Which is quite nice if you are wanting to get next to a archer and block it from uh, attacking. That was never an option before and now it is, which just makes the Harpy Hag even better than it already is. Again, though, I don't think it moves the needle on me wanting to promote it into uh, a, a triple plus or, uh, or, or the S tier, but a really nice upside for the Harpy Hag as well. The next town I want to talk about is the Stronghold, where they have changed the cost of the Cyclops Cave. It used to be that you had to pay 20... Uh, crystal to even get the cave up and running in the first place. Um, 
Now you don't pay any crystal to get the basic cave, but you do pay 10 crystal in order to upgrade it. So it's a lot more accessible and sort of easy to get moving uh, on your Cyclops cave. Now, in addition to that, something I do want to call out similar to with what happened with the giants, we now have the Wolf Raider Picket as an adventure map uh, location where you can go and beat the Wolf Raiders and your prize is Cyclops. And that's really nice. That really helps buff their viability and desirability in terms of building the dwelling and buying the guys at the time that they become available. Because the 10 crystal isn't the end of the world, I think the main Cyclops King gets promoted to be up in the same region as where his the, the, the little brother version is. Um, and I think they're both moving to somewhere like A- minus for the basic Cyclops something I'm keen to do, get that cave and start saving them and do the Wolf Raider Picket and start collecting them and using them. Solid, solid creature for the money that you spend. A minus, A minus now for a Cyclops. I think maybe the King, it's probably just a little bit under, but not far under. Uh, let's find a space for him in B plus, even though that's already a very, very busy, uh, very busy part of the world. Okay, so again, even though the power level of those units hasn't been buffed, the accessibility has, and that really uh, improves the gold coins, well, the, the power per gold coin spent or per um, opportunity foregone for, for, for these units that are affected by these changes. Right, what's next? Okay, and now we come to the Conflux, which of all the towns has had the biggest changes of all. Where do we begin? Well, sprites are, let's start from tier one. It used to be that you could go straight from pixies to up upgrade them straight to sprites and then start flying around on day two or <laughs> as soon as possible with sprites. You could get the Garden of Life to get 30 sprites per week um, in the uh, by the time you have the uh, castle upgrade. And that's just amazing, you know, and you can get so much done with these first striking, no retaliation, high movement, flying girls. Yes, as soon as they meet with a magic arrow, they're in big trouble. But the amount of uh, unfair things you can get done before that happens in the vanilla game was just unfair, completely ridiculous. Now, what the guys have done is they've changed the build order so that you can't, you can't go straight from pixies to sprites the same way you used to. You have to build a mage guild first. Okay, And at first glance, you might say, well, that's not too bad. I was going to do that anyway. But the key reason why sprites are special in the vanilla game is that you don't need anything. You just go for it. And in week one, they just tear up the countryside. They're insanely good in that vanilla game in week one. Right, it's week one is really, really where I want that value to, 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 be, to be leveraged because I expect them to die by the mid game. I expect them all to be dead by week four or five. Now, having to build the Mage Guild first, well, by the time I do that in a resource constrained start where I start on zero, yeah, I am going to get the Mage Guild on my way to City Hall, but it might not be until week two, week three, that I finally get the Mage Guild up. Once I've got it up, sure, I'll do this upgrade. But how excited am I to get back and get the Pixies upgraded? Probably not very. I think probably I'll let the Pixies build up, sit there building up, and when I can eventually get back, I'll buy them all as a single upgrade, the kind of thing we talked about doing with the Sea Dogs. That's the kind of thing I'll do with these, these girls now, these sprites. But I might not be fighting with them until week three maybe late week two. So that means their desirability and priority goes down. I don't know where, because as I, I haven't played Conflux in this new format, but I feel like, I feel like it's probably not better than A minus. It's probably B plus. I'm gonna say B plus for a Sprite now. That even might still be too generous. Because the real juice, the real X factor of those girls is week one, day one, even. So I found a new home for them here in, um, in, in the decent B range. I do think it is something I'll be doing as a fairly high priority, but there might be plenty of game case scenarios where I'm running around, haven't quite got around to Mage Guild yet, and by the time I do, they're just okay as something that I'll do, but won't be particularly happy or sad about doing value for money is still ridiculous with these girls like the amount of gold coins you spend per power level is, is, is still fantastic i mean really really good um so yeah I, I can't see them being worse than a b plus now the next major change that's been made to the conflux is uh with regard to the elementals uh psychic elementals and 
magic elementals. Um, these have been nerfed basically in a way whereby their stats and stuff, they fight the same way, but they're way more expensive. They're 50% more expensive. So per model, they're really expensive and they're going to put a serious dent in your finances. This is one of the problems with the complex though in general I don't like about the other four elementals is the value for money. Like you can see earth elemental and just like what is going on at tier five. But generally speaking, the elementals, I haven't given them a very high score just because I don't find them to be amazing value for money. They're decent on the field of combat, sure. But the amount of money and effort I've got to put in to get the thing is just okay. You know, and not to be confused with the summon elementals, which are just pure upside. Um, now, with these guys, I love magic elementals. I said A+, plus, right? Because immune to every spell in the game is a busted ability, a ridiculous Attack every hex around me and no retaliation. What? Like, they should probably be special. Like, they probably should have been at S tier the first time. I'm not putting them in S now because they're quite expensive. They're 50% more expensive than they used to be. So I think that's what I want to do. I want to promote them to S to correct maybe a slight undervaluation last time, but then demote them back down again to where they are based on the fact that they are going to put a dent in your pocket uh, with, I think it's like 1,200 per, per model now at... Yeah, 1,200 per, per, per model. I think the Thought Elemental, Psychic Elemental down here at B-, minus, that's pr probably a bit generous now. Um, on the other hand, I might be stuck with them for a while until I can afford to the upgrade and to upgrade all the, the Psychics that I've bought. I think he's probably okay to leave where he is relative to... The, I mean, the fact that we are nerfing the Sprites, we're also about to nerf... Phoenixes, as we'll see now in a second. So these guys probably are about the same level of priority that, that, that they were before. Okay, but just wanted to acknowledge that cost increase for those guys. Now, major changes also made to Phoenixes. In the vanilla game, you can get the Pyre and upgraded Pyre very cheaply. You can start buying Phoenixes. You get four per week by default, and they're two grand per bird. And that is just busted. They're so, so good per pound, per gold coin spent. Amazing. Their combat statistics are great. Fastest unit in the game. They're going to hand you the first turn a lot of the time. And value for money is just absolutely out of, blow, blows it out of the water. You're going to be skipping past tier five. You're not going to bother buying the earth elementals. You save all that money, spend it on phoenixes, as I explained in the first video. Now, what have the guys done? Well, the first thing that's happened is that you can't just get four per week for free anymore. It's been nerfed down to three per week, but you can build a new building called the Vault of Ashes for 5,000 gold, which will up that to an additional plus one Phoenix per week. So you can get back up to four per week, but you've got to pay for it. In addition, each bird is 50% more expensive. So same as the Magic Elementals, that's now 3,000 gold per bird instead of 2,000. And that is a major, major haircut to their cost of effectiveness and cost efficiency. Um, I actually think that uh, in I've had some limited expo exposure playing with the top end of Complex in Horn of the Abyss just recently, and I found it the case that I wasn't it wasn't a huge priority beelining my way to Phoenixes the way I normally would, and I was actually playing around with Firebirds uh, for longer than I otherwise normally would have. Now, countering all of this, there's another new feature in Horn of the Abyss where you have this red elemental tower adventure map location where when you defeat the fire elementals, your prize is firebirds. So there's this weird thing going on, actually, where I feel like firebirds, ironically, even though they're more expensive, they have a 50% increase to their cost, weirdly get a buff. I actually think a firebird is now something that I'm more keen to build the pyre and start saving and buying than I was before. But the Phoenix is not. The Phoenix is an okay, good, solid thing you'll find yourself doing, um, but it'll be competing for your money with other things you could be doing in the Empire in a way that it didn't have to before. Okay, so I think Firebird actually gets a promotion. You can start saving these and be pretty happy with them, and you'll be fighting with them in the late game as well now uh, in a way that you didn't used to. Um, I think it's at least A-, minus, but maybe you could even challenge for something a bit further up for, for, for the Firebird. The Phoenix, it's still an upgrade I want to do, you know, but it is just isn't the massive priority that it used to be. Um, is B-plus too harsh? 
I think actually the Phoenix can um, go to the same location. Okay, and slight nod to the Firebird now for maybe being actually a little bit better in terms of value for money and excitement factor. Uh, that red elemental tower uh, really does help uh, prop things up in, in the same way that it has for the Cyclops and stuff as well. Um, so still a high priority unit, uh, still incredible. I mean, the fastest unit in the game, all good things and high priority. Um, so I think A- is still absolutely fine for the Phoenix. Bit of a shame that we lose one of our specials because it almost looks a little bit like uh, the specialty is a little bit thin now. Um, but let's see how we go. Let's keep going um, uh, through the rest of the tweaks that we want to make as well uh, before, before we finish off. One other key unit in the Conflux that I really want to zoom in on now and acknowledge before we move into the general sort of errata and other tidying up that needs to be done is the Storm Elemental. Had a lot of pushback from you guys on my ranking of these. They're actually buried here, as you can see behind the Basilisk, sort of meandering around in the C uh, category. And my rationale for that in uh, the first video was that, look, I've got to build the Mage Guild to get them, and I'd rather just pour all my money into the Sprites and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get them, I'll use them. But I'm not super excited about it. They're not a massive priority for me. Um, I feel like you've persuaded me that actually that's an underrating. In addition to that, now I can't even get the sprites without doing the Mage Guild anyway as well. And uh, Storm Elementals will be kind of a linchpin now for the Conflux when I play it, a lot more than it maybe it used to be. I still don't find them insane value for money, for the gold you spend and the hassle you go to to build them. Uh, they're still... Uh, just okay for me. I don't love them as much as you guys all do, but I think I'm willing to admit them to, I was going to say A-, minus, but do I really believe that? I know, you guys are here going, Paul, you're an idiot, they're S. Like, so, like you guys love this unit. Uh, for me, they're just okay. Like, they are better than what I gave them here, even in the vanilla mode, probably. And I think acknowledging the nerf to the other uh, creatures that have happened in the Conflux, there's a natural buff that they should enjoy as a result. Um, B plus. So there they are. There was a slot actually in the back row for them. So um, so so that's them moved. I think that's okay. That's about as far as I'm willing to go with them, though, guys. I appreciate that you uh, you might not agree. Now I think that is actually the end of all of the changes I wanted to make to the list based on the balance effects of uh, Horn of the Abyss. Okay. So Magog's obviously teleporting up to really really solid status. Um, giants and all the rest of it, the stuff that we talked about there. So to finish things off, I want to just address a couple of mistakes I made in the first video and talk about a couple of the creatures where we've had some really lively debates and might make a couple of changes uh, in that regard as well um, for the creatures that sort of stirred up the most controversy. Um, in the castle, I had forgotten, when I started to hit the record button, I had this whole thing where, you know, you're starstruck in front of the camera. I had forgotten the build order of um, griffins and swords, uh, swordsmen. Uniquely in the castle, you can't get griffins until you've built the um, barracks for the swordsmen first, which is a real back-to-front way uh, that isn't replicated anywhere else in the game, as far as I know. Okay, I made a big fuss about griffins, the fact that you can have the horde dwelling to get lots of them. I love the infinite retaliations, the HP the stodgy, solid nuisance stack that they can be, flying over walls, using them in the, even the late game to, um, to sack towns and so on. That is all still pretty much true, but what isn't true is the ease with which you can get it started and get it rolling. Okay, so I've, I need to make an adjustment. I need these two units to come down the list in terms of value for money, still powerful, but, less, uh, but more expensive than I remember, more difficult than I remember. And the opposite is true with swordsmen. Okay, so I think what I want is for the Griffin to find its way to B minus, the Royal to find its way to probably A minus. Okay, so that's the birdies moved uh, to I think a more appropriate position. I still really love Royal Griffins, but yeah, I, I had misremembered uh, the build order and the fact that that's that's a problem. You've got to get the barracks going first. It's a whole extra two grand that you've got to find before you can begin stockpiling and using these these creatures. Um, now, with the Swordsman, uh, yeah, it's basically a Tier 3 unit, but with a Tier 4 body. Quite useful, and something that um, I probably do use more than D-. Uh, I don't use Monks and Zealots. They are staying there. Uh, that, that's right. I, don't, I just don't use I skip past. I build the dwelling so I can get on to the next thing. That's not true with Swordsman. I, I'll use these in the early game, 
And I obviously want their bodies to stay alive so that I can make them into crusaders, who I'll talk about now in a second. Um, I think these are a really solid unit uh, by comparison to what I ranked them in the first video. So hands up on that one. Uh, just have to figure out where I'm going to put them. I tell you what, crusaders are moving. So let's put them there. Some of you will enjoy seeing them up there. I'm sure some of you feel they should be there. Uh, so I'll leave them there for a second. Um, and I'll give Swordsman the old slot from the Crusaders. They're going to inherit that, sp that, that space. Okay, now as for the Crusader, I had it in my head that the Crusader uh, cost 10 crystal and uh, some gems or, or whatever to uh, upgrade the dwelling. I had it in my head that the dwelling upgrade was really expensive. I think I was confusing it a little bit with Ogre Mages and Vampire Lords, that Tier 4 thing where you go from a basic Tier 4 to an insane Tier 4. Um, the cost of that upgrade is not that bad. It's only five uh, crystal. And uh, Crusaders, if that stack of Swordsmen is still alive into the mid-game, is going to be a very high priority. Their damage output, man per man per pound, with the two attacks, is better than all of the other high damage uh, multiple attack uh, dudes. So, so he's more powerful than an Acid, um, uh, you know, or, or, or what have you, when he's dealing those two attacks. Um, so yeah, I think he's actually a heck of a lot better than C+. And um, again, given that you don't need Griffins, you can just get Swordsmen, get Crusaders and do stuff with that, and, and skip Griffins if you want to. It means that they're a much more alter uh, powerful and uh, viable alternative uh, to the Griffins than I had uh, I, I had remembered. I think these guys deserve an A-. Uh, so there he is. He slots in alongside the Royals in A-. minus. Really, really solid investment, the Crusader, and uh, it was a mistake to put in so low, I think, in the first video. So hopefully a few of you guys will be happy that I've um, made that change uh, for those guys. So that's Griffins uh, and Crusader's Swordsman. Another uh, mistake I made is, in the video I talked about Lizard Men and Lizard Warriors, and in, I, in my memory I had it that the Lizard Man dealt 2-5 to five damage along with the Lizard Warrior. And I had it in my head that it's not a big priority to upgrade them because you get that damage anyway, and what's the point? You just get a bit more speed. That's actually not true. The Lizard Man has four moves and deals two to three damage. He's currently here. The Lizard Warrior is the one you want. You want to upgrade that thing. Get these guys. They're not going to, you know, they're hard to kill. That's one really good thing about them. Get them upgraded, though. Plus one movement is really, really nice. Actually helps in the turn order a lot. But they go from two to three damage all the way to two to five damage and they love being blessed. These are the guys that I think of fondly when I think about lizard men. Uh, not, and I got, I essentially got it the wrong way around. So I've said there that I want to swap these two over. Lizard men, something I'm going to want to do early and use them in that first week or two. But then I want to get the upgrade, and it's a pretty high priority actually. Um, I can go from these guys. My they're competing against serpent flies, which are great. I love serpent flies. They're here somewhere. Um, you know, and wyverns, the potential of getting your wyvern nest up online early. So I think that's probably why they didn't make it up to the very high B+. Um, but yeah, solid, solid unit. The Lizard Warrior, uh, Lizard Man belongs more in the in the C plus category. There's two creatures left that I want to talk about. And the first of those is the Ancient Behemoth. Um, I said in the first video that I like the first Behemoth, the basic Behemoth, because he's fairly cheap and he's a great fighter and useful. You can get them in the mid-game, get them quite quickly, and get them moving. And I sort of said that by the time I can afford to upgrade the cave, or the, uh, whatever it's, the Behemoth Crag, ah, there's other cool upgraded Tier 8 level, Tier 7, what I used to, what I was going, Tier 8 level creatures that I could be doing in my other towns instead, and I often, Ancient Behemoths just end up not being a huge priority for me. But I think in fairness, you guys have pointed out that pound for pound, gold coin for gold coin, the Ancient Behemoth, Hits like an absolute truck. He, he actually, for each dollar spent on an Ancient Behemoth, that stack will beat any other unit in the game, just about any other unit in the game, I think. Certainly any other Tier 7 unit, which I had underrated, and I hadn't really um, given enough credence, I think, in the first video. With that said, the 80% damage reduction is lovely and everything, but I still feel like it has a little bit of the Hydra disease. I've, I need to help it out. It can't get through the walls itself. It has to be teleported over, or you've got to have ballistics, or some other way of leveraging it in a siege. Um, it doesn't always get its way, right? It can be blinded. It can be messed with. Some of these other top, top units, yeah, it doesn't have first strike or no retaliation the way this thing does. It doesn't have insane ranged attack the way this thing does. 
it's so uh, yeah it's good it's good it's better than a d plus fair enough I, I hear you for me though i still don't love it as much as the community at large loves it so i'm willing to acknowledge it's got a lot more utility than i said in the first video um where do i want to put it now that cyclops is so high up i think i'm just going to restrict it to b plus but solid nod and a solid uh, acknowledgement to all of you guys out there who thought that they were quite hard done by in the first video. Okay, so new home for him there, uh, squeezed into the B+. Hope that uh, hope that's satisfactory to people. Um, I realised actually before, now that we've done the Ancient Behemoth, I, there was a creature on the list I wanted to get to before I close off. Uh, I've got two creatures left I want to talk about, which is the Champion and the Archangel. All right. Now, the Champion, I gave him a D. Um... I didn't have that much pushback. I had a couple of people saying, what? No, they, what are you talking about? They're worse than a dwarf. I had a couple of people pointing that out. But it actually has weighed on my mind uh, more than it should. I think this is an underrating. The basic cavalier, I'll stand by what I said, which is that, like, oh, for what you get for your money, it's just, eh, just all right. It's not a like big priority. But I'll build the training grounds and allow these guys to stockpile, and then I'll buy the champions. I will. They are competing with angels, though. And angels are expensive and difficult to get online. That's the main rationale for why I gave them a low score. It's just because they're competing with these amazing, this amazing tier 7 unit. And I just find I don't always buy them as quickly as I'm physically able to. I think D is wrong. And um, they should probably be more up in that same conversation as the, the swordsmen were earlier. So I'm going to put them there. Okay, so I'm happy with that move. Maybe you can argue, ah, come on, surely they're bees, they're, they're, sh they're surely a more higher priority, but uh, for me, I just find when I play Castle, they aren't that much of a priority, even though they are powerful. I'll, I'll acknowledge that, and probably more powerful than I, than I would have said in the first video. Okay, my voice is given out. There's one last creature I do want to talk about, which is the Archangel. Now, probably the most controversial rating of everything I've put on here. Now, you guys love the Archangel. Um, S++++. For a lot of you guys that are watching in an in a resource constrained environment for me i've really thought about this right if you're playing a fast game pvp where you both start with 100 grand and it's a three week game you're getting to archangels go yes get the portal of glory upgraded get the archangels sure i mean amazing unit no one's absolutely arguing the sheer power level the fact that they can do resurrection second fast unit fastest unit in the game the, the, the virtue on the field of battle is unquestionable. They are great. Sure. Agreed. However, to get the first portal of glory, I've got to find 20 grand and 10 of every resource. If I'm playing in a resource-constrained start here, okay? Now, for a basic tier 7 unit, I want that coming on in the middle of the mid-game. Okay? That's hard to achieve, but worth it for this fellow here who gives me, you know, 50 damage, 9 flying movement, 200 HP. I mean, that sound of the singing sword as it whistles through the air. I can go to Griffin Conservatories to top up my stack. What a huge, amazing priority. A-grade unit, yes. Okay. However, to get the Archangel, I've got to do that all over again. I've got to find another 10 of everything and another 20 grand, and I've got to find 2 grand per guy to upgrade my existing dudes to the Archangel. So if you can find the money to do that, you've more or less, in my experience, you've more or less got enough money to win the game one way or the other anyway. And you might find you're better off spending that money somewhere else in one of your other towns that maybe needs to be propped up. Maybe it's time to go Mighty Gorgon somewhere elsewhere in your empire. Maybe it's time to get those Black Dragons up elsewhere in your empire. Build a castle in uh, the towns that are more vulnerable um, to protect them against enemy incursions and just keep using your, your normal uh, existing angels. So how excited am I? And how much of a priority is it for me to spend my precious resources on getting to archangels at the time I'm able to? My answer is moderately so. I didn't give them a D, right? I didn't say that they're useless units, E, because they're such terrible value for money. That's not how I feel. They're good value for money because they're so powerful. They're ridiculously powerful on the battlefield. But you've got to pay some serious, serious De Niro to get there. So as unpopular as this is going to be to round out the video, I'm not moving them. I'm keeping them there in the solid B section. I hope you guys can forgive me for that. Uh, but I hope I've explained as well my rationale for why that is.
So I started moving things around just to make it look better, not to actually change the ratings. And I realized there's a couple of other tweaks I want to make here. The Nagas are um, better now, right? With all the changes made to the tower, it's a massively buffed town. Tier four, 5, 6, and 7 all get stronger. I didn't really talk too much about the Nagas. I think I'm happy with the Queens where they are. But the basic one has a lot more viability and early game appeal than it used to. So I'm going to give that a promotion. I'm also looking here at Dragonflies against Vampire Lords and wondering if they're the right way around. I really like both. Um, they're both very special to me. Vampire Lords are special to everybody out there in the community. They don't, no one's arguing with me about these being special. Probably some people would prefer that they were up here. For me, the, the resources, the gems and crystal to get the, the guys working in the first place, they're more of a tier four and a half. And for that, I get I, they're ridiculously busted, uh, the things you can do with them provided you can keep that critical mass going. So there's a little slight caveat on their awesomeness um, based on cost, which is why they're down at the bottom end of that special. With the dragonflies, so much upside. I love doing it. It's cheap and easy to get them. The huge movement. You've got the first turn all the time when using them all through, all through the mid game until the really big stuff comes online. But I do think maybe we could swap these over. Uh, I think there's a good case for that. Um, Vampire Lord's probably a bit, bit further up that special ranking than I had said the first time. I don't think dwarfs are that... Like stone golems and dwarfs probably should be further down. I think maybe we could say archmages become more optional, cheaper dwelling. We talked about the medusas having the option to walk around and use their petrification instead. Chaos hydras probably are more exciting to get to than a dwarf. Probably as well, since this, uh, since the first video got recorded, I got kind of trounced by Chaos Hydras in a, a fight against an enemy uh, a witch who teleported them into the center of my, what had, I had created a ring of uh, high-level powerful creatures, uh, and she teleported the Chaos Hydra right into the middle of them. And uh, <clears throat> I probably wasn't, um, that, that wasn't at the forefront of my mind when I made the first video, let's just say. I'm thinking that I want to just rejig this a little bit down the bottom here. Okay, so I think I like this better. Um, yeah, Silver Pegasus is about as exciting for, the, for me as this. This is about right for me. I still don't think Medusa is a very good value for money. Um, and these guys are still a problem, uh, the resources required to get them online in the first place. So that's fine. But I, a basic dwarf, I'm just getting the dwarf dwelling up, and then I'm going to get to battle dwarfs as quickly as possible. And then the battle dwarf himself is actually a pretty solid, uh, solid old gentleman. So that's it. That's the final picture as things stand here in uh, March of 2024. In my opinion, in Horn of the Abyss, this is the tier list for each creature that you can purchase in the game. Uh, I might return to it one day when uh, we have more, if we ever have more factions or more balance changes, that kind of thing. But in the meantime, if you are still with me and if you've watched through the entire thing, as I know some of you do, Thank you so much. I really appreciate your company on the journey, and I hope it's been a chill sort of session, much like the first video uh, was. I certainly enjoyed doing it. It's taken a heck of a lot longer to produce uh, and get to uh, the end point here than uh, I'd anticipated, but it was totally worth it. I had an absolute blast doing it. Do check out the channel for your all of your Heroes of Might and Magic 3 needs, in particular my series of Iron Man Impossible Difficulty level runs. Uh, a new one on there for the factory actually just went up in the last week or so. So do check that out. In the meantime, I'd love to hear from you guys, as always. If you've got any strong opinions, positive or negative, you know, let me know what you think of these rankings in the comments, uh, where you disagree with me. I'd love to hear from you, as always. So again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.